My name is Matt Hostley, and I'm a developer relations technical artist at Epic Games. I helped out the Quixel team with materials and performance on their medieval game environment. Today, we're going to talk about how we improved the performance of the project with a few simple changes that didn't dramatically impact the visuals. In the last video, we talked about how we optimized the lighting and shadows in the scene, and in this video, we'll talk about what we can do to render our scene more efficiently with instant static meshes, reduce the complexity of objects in the distance with the hierarchical level of detail system, and only render what we can actually see by setting draw distances on foliage. As my colleague Jacob Coidel discussed in a previous video, the thatched roofs of our houses are constructed of many individual static meshes. This allowed the artists plenty of freedom of construction, but this isn't the most efficient way to render this feature. GPUs like to do the same thing over and over and over again, and it will take more time to do a bunch of different things in a row. Imagine you're painting a fence. It's much easier to paint a fence one color than it is to paint each slat a different color, since you don't spend as much time gathering new paint for each slat. In the graphics world, we call these fence slats draw calls. You can think of a draw call as the same geometry with the same material. So in our example of the colorful fence, each slat would be a different draw call. More slats, more draw calls, more time to render the frame. We can think of this static mesh, for example, as requiring two draw calls, since it has two material slots, the old wooden barrel material for the roof and the support beam material for the flashing. We have a few different thatch meshes, but just because they're the same geometry with the same material, they're not necessarily treated as a single draw call, since we don't want to worry about all the thatches that aren't on the screen at any given time. To find a balance between culling and instancing, in Unreal 4.22, we added dynamic instancing to help batch draw calls together. We detect if two or more nearby actors share the same geometry and material, and draw them as one draw call. We can see the benefits of this dynamic instancing really quickly. First, we run the console command stat, RHI, and this shows us a number of stats about the rendering part. We're interested in this number here, draw primitive calls. This is the thing we're trying to reduce. Next, we can turn off dynamic instancing by running the console command r.meshdrawcommands.dynamicinstancing0. Look at the number of draw primitive calls increase. Let's run r.meshdrawcommands.dynamicinstancing1 to turn that back on since it saves us so many draw calls. Dynamic instancing, however, can only do so much. It won't batch every usage of the same geometry and the same material since we need to account for the various LODs of a given static mesh and how far the way the meshes are from each other, etc, etc, etc. So, since we knew that the number of thatches wasn't totally optimal, but we wanted to maintain some amount of editability for the artists, we had to find a more efficient way to draw the thatches. We can give the GPU some hints about what should be batched together into a single draw call using instanced static mesh components. Each one will effectively be one draw call. Once we were satisfied with the look of the thatched roofs, I merged the thatches for each house into a single actor made up of a few instant static mesh components. All I had to do was select all of the thatch actors, right click, merge actors, then select this mode over on the right that harvests geo from the selected actors and merges them into an instant static mesh component. Because we did this toward the end of the project, and to ensure we could change the thatches if necessary, I decided to use Keep Original Actors as Editor Only, since they won't be rendered at all, but they're there just in case we ever need to change things around. I knew this was the right way to go because we had a limited number of thatch types, and a whole bunch of them all in the same area. This led to a big overall reduction in the number of draw calls for the house. This technique can be really useful in places where you use a lot of a few different static meshes in a contiguous area. For example, in some cases where you'd merge your static meshes into a single static mesh actor, but don't want to worry about the memory overhead of an additional static mesh. This technique could have been applied to the windmill blades, for example, which were kit bashed together from a number of smaller pieces of wood and shingles. As I mentioned earlier, GPUs like to do the exact same thing over and over and over again. But there is an exception, and that's drawing to the same pixel over and over and over again. This happens if, for example, we stack some fog cards on top of each other. Each fog plane needs to be rendered, so we have to calculate each pixel of the fog planes multiple times. You can see how many times a pixel is rendered in a frame if we go to View Modes, 
optimization view modes, quad overdraw. The colors correspond to the number of times a pixel is drawn. For example, this high spot in the middle is our fog, and this shows us that we're drawing each single pixel more than 10 times. If we hide these, we can see this big band of green in the middle here. This means that we're still rendering each of these pixels about four times, which isn't efficient. Why is that? Well, the other way a GPU will end up drawing the same pixel more than once is at the edges of trying, since we need to rasterize that vector information. With that in mind, if a triangle is smaller than four pixels, we'll still render the four pixel area occupied by that triangle, or quad. This can often happen when you have highly detailed geometry that's off in the distance. We've linked some resources below that help explain what's happening here, but for now suffice it to say that subpixel triangles are bad because they result in quad overdraw, which causes us to render more pixels than on the screen. There's a few ways we can improve this. The first, of course, is to make sure our meshes have level of detail meshes, or LODs. With each level of detail, we reduce the complexity of the geometry as the mesh gets further and further away from the camera to help us mitigate quad overdraw and subpixel triangles. For this project, we used the Unreal Engine's built-in and powerful automatic LOD generation tools, and that made it super easy and painless for us. You can learn more about this in the links we've provided below. But what happens when those final LODs are really far away? Won't those triangles be too small and on the screen and lead to quad overdraw? Yes! That's okay. One thing we could do, of course, is not draw them at all and set the max draw distance on the actor itself, but we can't do that for large objects like the houses. So what do we do when we want to draw something beyond the final LOD of our geo, but something even more simplified? Enter the hierarchical level of detail, or HLOD. The HLOD system creates an even more simplified mesh to represent a group of objects that's meant to be used very far away, a proxy mesh if you will. We can automatically generate clusters of these objects and the proxy meshes for those clusters. Here's how. First, I'll open the HLOD Outliner, which is just up here under Window, HLOD Outliner. For each level in which we wanted to use the HLOD system, we have to enable that by setting it in the Levels World settings. I'll go to the LOD System group and check the Enable Hierarchical Level of Detail system checkbox. For our purposes, we were happy with the default cluster generation and mesh generation settings, but I highly recommend you tune these to your needs. We'll need to set this checkbox in every sublevel that will use HLODs, including the persistent level, which we've just done, the geometry sublevel, and each of the houses into the forge. In each house sublevel, I'll of course enable the HLOD system, and in the HLOD outliner, I'll make sure to check Generate Single Cluster for Level. Since this whole house sublevel is contained in a contiguous area, we can skip the time consuming cluster generation process since we already know that we only need one HLOD to represent the whole house. This was one of the big benefits of building these houses into their own sublevels. Now that we've enabled the HLOD system for all of our sublevels, we're back in the main level, and it's time to turn the HLOD system loose. In the HLOD outliner, we'll just hit this big red build button up in the corner. This process can take some time as we're looping over all of the geometry in the scene to group it together into clusters, and then generating proxy messages for each of those clusters. Again, this will take some time for the scene, so sit back and relax. Now that our clusters and proxy meshes have finished generating, we can see them all individually in the HLOD app. I can expand one of these HLOD actors and see which actors are included in the cluster, zoom to them, and see the size of the cluster. Since these proxy meshes are automatically generated, they'll need to be updated from time to time as you make changes to your level. Just like lighting needs to be rebuilt, you'll see HLOD clusters need to be rebuilt in the top left corner of your viewport since we try to detect when you've made changes to the level and alert you. You can rebuild individual clusters by right-clicking on them and selecting Rebuild Proxy Mesh. But what about foliage? When you paint foliage into the world using Unreal Engine's built-in tools, these instances aren't included when we generate HLODs. What can we do? As with static mesh actors, we can set the max draw distances on our foliage so that as we get further away from smaller meshes, we stop drawing them all together. The good news is that we can tell Unreal when to not draw foliage with relative ease using Bulk Edit via Property Matrix. In the Content Browser, I'll filter by Foliage. 
Select All. Right-click, Asset Actions, Bulk Edit via Property Matrix, which shows us this view. Next, we'll need to show the properties we want to change. I just want to see Instant Settings, Call Distances, Min, and Max. I'll hover over each of these and click the little pin icon to show these properties in the column view. You can read more about these in the links we've provided below, just know that we've set up our foliage to start fading out at the min distance and be fully faded out and not drawn at all at the max distance. If you don't want to fade your foliage, you can just set the max distance and they'll be fully invisible. I set these values based on the size of the foliage. For example, the broken pine tree assembly is rather large, so I'll make sure that we can see it for quite a ways. As you're doing this in your projects, it's good to get a sense of the scale of your scene and the size of these objects. Set your camera far away from one of your target meshes and tune the values accordingly. I also know that anything with the name spruce in it is one of our larger trees that can be seen from all the way across the map. So we'll set those values so we don't end up with a sparse foliage at the tree line. Finally, I looked for small foliage types and set those values very low. For instance, we don't need to see this carrot from all the way across the map. Be sure to check out the project on the Unreal Engine Marketplace to see how we set the call distances for all of our different foliage types. I hope this video has given you some ideas about how to improve the performance of your project by cleverly reducing the number of draw calls, the number of things we're drawing, and the complexity of things we're drawing. Thanks for watching.